Okay, so I'll echo Adam's um, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'll race through pretty quickly so that we can have as much chance uh, for Q&A at the end. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Cold Spring Harbor Lab is a research institute on the North Shore of Long Island in New York. Um, we have about 600 scientific staff, um, 50 research groups working in molecular biology, genetics, cancer, neuroscience, genomics, and quantitative biology. Um, the, the lab is ranked by Thomson and Reuters in 2012, number one in the world in uh, molecular biology and genetics. That's from 2012. I think MIT are hot on our heels, um, so I'm going to stick with the numbers from 2012. Um, but it's not just a research institute. We have a big science education and communication program. Um, we have a conference center. Um, we have a very focused um, uh, think tank center called the Banbury Center, where we have very small meetings on specific uh, science policy issues. We also have a conference center in Suzhou in China. Um, there's a graduate school at Cold Spring Harbor. We have a residential lab and run on, um, on-site courses in various aspects of neuroscience, uh, cell and molecular biology. And we have the DNA Learning Center, which teaches kids about genetics. And finally, we have the publishing arm, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, uh, for which I'm assistant director. Um, so the press publishes a variety of material. We, we do many different books, textbooks, uh, handbooks, lab manuals, and even some history books. Um, we have five research journals. Uh, these include Genome, Recent, uh, Genome Research, where the um, eminent uh, Laurie Goodman made her name. She apparently also worked somewhere called Nature, but I don't know much about that. Um, and we have three review journals, Cold Spring Harbor Protocols, Perspectives in Biology, and Perspectives in Medicine. Um, and the latest addition to this was last year we launched a preprint server called BioArchive, um, a place where scientists could make their work free to read before it was submitted to a journal and get feedback in preparation for submitting to a journal to try and improve the manuscript. Um, the main reason for doing this, um, there are a couple of reasons, but the main one was really that scientists were getting very, very frustrated about the amount of time it took from submission to a journal to publication, anywhere between three months and three years. And you know, so many of them feel that this is a huge waste of time, particularly if it's something that's in your area where you know all about it and you feel that you're capable of judging the material yourself, then you feel like, I want to read it now and make my own decisions on it. If it's further away from my field, I'll wait for peer review. But if it's right in my field, sometimes I want to read it now and I'll take that chance and I'll essentially do the peer review for myself. Um, we had a lot of comments. These, these are just some quotes from some scientists. One, think how much time is wasted in that base in the course of that three months to three years. I could have been doing experiments, but I had to wait until the paper came out. So we, we, we were hearing, hearing that a lot. We were also hearing for young, younger scientists who are writing grant applications and typically don't have a big publication record. So they're writing grant applications, they're applying for jobs, but, you know, they basically have a couple of publications and four things that they've submitted that haven't been peer-reviewed yet and not out. And so they said, we need to have a preprint server where we can put this stuff so people can go and, go and find it, um, you know, rather than waiting such a long time. Um, the other thing we'd noticed was that there was more and more biology appearing in the physics archive. As, as many of you know, for 20 years, um, physics engineers um, Mathematicians have been putting preprints up on the physics archive, um, and there's, there's almost a million papers up there now. So um, there are a few biologists on there. Um, there's a quantitative biology category there. It's, it's not really divided up the way um, biology, biologists would look at field. It's, it wasn't clear what was and what wasn't quantitative biology. So various uh, scientists encouraged us to uh, launch a biology version, which we did last year, uh, BioArchive. So, BioArchive is a not-for-profit service of a lab. It's, it's free to submit, it's um, free to read, and it makes papers available before they're submitted to a journal. Uh, the, the posting is almost immediate, 24 to 48 hours, and there's just a light screen to check that everything is actually a paper and it's actually science. And, and critically, um, authors can post a revised version at any time. Just to go the through the feature set, um, each manuscript's um, date stamped, given a DOI, which is registered by Crossref as a working paper. Um, the manuscripts are indexed in Google Scholar. Um, there's three different article types 
uh, authors can choose, new results, confirmatory results, and contradictory results. And the latter two categories were really there to provide a place for authors to put some of the manuscripts that they found it difficult to get into journals, or journals might not even consider, particularly con contradictory results. Um, and that's, you know, was, um, Adam and uh, Laurie mentioned concerns about reproducibility, and that was one of the reasons for that. There's a variety of subject categories. Um, authors can authors hold copyright, and they can, they can choose from a variety of licenses um, under which to uh, make the content available to readers. Uh, we provide article metrics. There's commenting on the site, and we provide links to the published version. So here's just a quick look at the site. You can see the, the list of papers, the subject categories on the right-hand side. If you drill down into an article, you'll see um, the, the DOI, that is registered Crossref, and on the right-hand side, there's um, the link to the author's PDF. PDF, and I should emphasize, this is the author's PDF. That none of this is typeset or anything. It's just what the author made. Um, in the history tab, you'll see that there's links to the previous versions of the of the manuscript that the author's uploaded. Um, and under metrics, we've got uh, article-level metrics provided by Highwire Press and alt metrics by altmetrics.com. Um, and here's just an example highlighting the link to the published version. This is a paper that appeared on BioArchive just before Christmas, and a few months later it came out in Nature. And so we have a script that um, looks for articles via PubMed and Crossref, identifies the published version, and puts up a link to it so that once the version's published, anybody who comes to the preprint version is automatically sent through to the published version. So where are we after a year? Um, well, we think we've done pretty well. We've had a lot of good feedback on the site. The authors love it. We've had around 1,000 submissions. Um, just over 90% of those passed the screen, so we're not getting too much junk up there. Um, and around 30% of the papers are revised one or more times. Um, it's typically one, once or twice people revise articles. We've had some, one person's revised their manuscript eight times, so you, this is clearly very useful to them. And I think the key thing for authors in encouraging adoption is that a year on, papers that have been, as preprints on BioArchive, have now appeared in more than 100 different journals. And these aren't, there, there are some niche journals, but there's also high-profile titles like Nature Science and, um, of course, Giga Science. Um, I think the other, the other thing that we would say we, we had done in terms of progress is that um, the behavior of biologists is is changing. A lot of them were very skeptical about this initially. There was a, there's a it's very keen advocates in population genetics and bioinformatics, but now we're seeing more and more cell biologists and developmental <coughs> biologists and ecologists posting, which, which we think is fantastic. Um, we've also seen policy changes amongst journals. Um, a, about a year ago, it wasn't really there were, there were a few journals that were a bit wary of, of, of preprint. They, they thought that maybe it was prior publication, maybe they couldn't publish a paper if it had been on the preprint server. And I'm delighted to say that we're, we're seeing that those journals are moving to acceptance of this. So that now the, the majority of journals in biomedical sciences that people would consider submitting to do allow this. Um, in, the, in the same time, the NIH biosketch is now able to, you can now include this um, as when you write your biosketch as an NIH investigator, you used to only be able to cite work that was in a peer-reviewed journal, but now you can cite preprints and data and various other things. So that's, that's increasing um, adoption as well, which is good. In terms of the subject of this panel, um, and our, our hope that this will improve manuscripts when they get to journals, I, there's, there's quite a lot of feedback that authors are getting on the site, which is, of course, you know, one of, one of the reasons for it. Um, the, the vast majority of the feedback is on Twitter. It's amazing. If you do a search for BioArchive on Twitter, you get thousands and thousands of results, people alerting each other to papers, discussing papers, and, and that's really been quite, quite phenomenal, the response on Twitter. There's, there's also um, a number of preprint discussion blogs um, Haldane's sieve is one in population genetics, Warburg's lens in mathematical oncology, and more recently, a scientist that actually at Cold Spring Harbor launched a blog called The Ideal Observer for discussing preprints in neuroscience. And the hope here is, again, these um, become uh, hubs for people to discuss papers and, and, and hopefully improve them. There's moderate feedback by commenting on the site. I, it's, it's not huge, but there's, there's some interesting threads, maybe about 15 comments a month. 
um, but not a huge amount. Of course, the, the real dark matter, I think, is um, feedback by email. And a lot of authors have told us that they're getting huge amounts of feedback by, by email on papers, which obviously it's hard for us to quantify. Um, I just put one example here, which I think was, was interesting um, in terms of the journal landscape. Uh, Leonid Krukliak, who's a big advocate of preprints um, from UCLA, he posted that, you know, is this the future? Um, and then he quoted an email he'd received where he'd received an email from a journal ed editor saying, I saw, your, I saw your paper on bioarchive, I was really interested. Would you consider submitting it to my journal? And we've seen um, other examples of that. And in fact, some various editors, journal editors have said to me, they now think that bioarchive is a great place for them to go prospecting for papers. So we, we, we think it's benefiting journals in that way as well. Um, Another thing we want to do to, to make the process easier for authors and journals is integrate BioArchive into the submission process that people use for journals. So I don't know if there was an announcement yesterday from the Genetic Society of America um, that you can now submit to Cold Spring, the Cold Spring Harbor Journal, Genome Research, or any one of the GSA journals, and simultaneously the um, paper will be immediately published, uh, posted on BioArchive waiting for its peer review to publication on, on the journal site. And we're going to um, do the reciprocal um, so that once people post on BioArchive, we want to find mechanisms for, to make it very easy for them to subsequently submit to a, to a journal by you know, porting the metadata through. And again, you know, that hopefully will save everyone time. So just to summarize, I think, where we're at and and, 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 and the benefits of, of bioarchive. I think the main thing really is this rapid transmission of results um, uh, well in advance of publication of the paper, well in advance of the validation of the results by peer review. Um, it's definitely uh, fostering uh, pre-publication discussion um, and, and increasing visibility for early career scientists who, as I said before, um, have this situation where they're often applying for grants where they don't yet have all the fruits of their labors in, the t in terms of uh, published papers to, to list, but they, they will have preprints. So that, that's, we, we think that's a, that's a huge advantage. Um, and I think one of the responses that, that, that I saw on Twitter, which I think kind of defines where we got to, was a couple of months ago, um, the site went down for routine maintenance one afternoon for about an hour and a half because of some work that was being doing, done at Stanford. And immediately there was all this discussion on Twitter about, you know, where is BioArchive? Why has it gone down? Why can't I log in? Et cetera, et cetera. And one of the commenters afterwards hit remarked, he said, congratulations, BioArchive. Um, you've gone from being an experiment to a utility that everybody expects to be up all the time. And so I think that's and that really signifies quite how far we've come in a year. So I, d I don't know if anybody has any specific questions about BioArchive. I'm happy to take them now. I think I have a couple of minutes, or we can wait until the end of the session. This one on the 